Good morning. Welcome to CEFA 2019. Very happy to start day two. We would like, first of all, to thank everyone who makes this effort possible to have in the table such interesting people with an expertise that will clear out a lot of on how to bring down to earth and materialize circular economy. So our sponsors are Area Metropolitana from the Aburra Valley. We had some of them yesterday at this table. Confama, obviously. Vrika, Catalina will tell us a little bit in detail on what this bed is about, where there's a lot of knowledge and expertise. We have Ripley in the States with the technological platform. Obviously, our platform of the of circular economy in the Americas is the great supporter of this effort. The Foundation for uh, Sustainability for the Americas, Camo Hub one of the companies aiming at innovation and entrepreneurship. And we have strategic allies such as uh, Crowd to Crowd Center, the Club of Circular Economy and the Circulars, whom we thank for all this effort and articulation to bring this to fruition into your computers. First of all, welcoming Catalina Zuluaga from Brica, Gloria Restrepo, Gloria Restrepo, uh, team leader for Circular Economy, and Federico Restrepo, entrepreneur, leader, counselor, expert in issues of mobility and sustainable development, and one of the heads of Impact Up Medellin. These couple of hours, we will be talking about the challenges we have in circular economy and how we can start capitalizing it. Obviously, you know what's going on in many sectors and contexts. And so we can show people what's what's happening in this revolution that has already taken off. So the first question for everyone, what do I imagine? I imagine a challenging horizon. Let's picture 2040, 2050. I don't know how old we'll be, if we'll have children, grandchildren. How do you see that world? How do you see Latin America, Medellin, Colombia, Mexico, etc.? I would like everyone to share how do you see that future, and we'll refine that lens to engage topics to get there from energy standpoint, mobility, from city challenges, construction, etc. So I leave the floor open. Who would like to start? Who's brave enough? I'm Gloria. I'll talk from the industrial standpoint. This is like the our stronghold. I think that in by 2030, 2040, there will be a great articulation in the industry with uh, synergies of industrial uh, synthesis, where basically we take advantage, a wide advantage of resources where we stop talking about waste and we start continue talking about resources of raw materials, of what uh, some don't use, others will, but in a very wide, uh, widespread manner, very structured manner. For then, it will probably a uh, wide need because of the lack of resources, because of population factors. We will need more resources. So I imagine a Medellin without without uh, the issues that we have today, where people start giving value to the the organic products uh, for the production of more food in this industrial symbiosis uh, without having to be part of a specific area, but generating all of these dynamics. That's what I see from uh, the industrial area. I see consumers who are much more aware, but also more demanding with what is produced. Those needs, those requirements from consumers 
also generates some more wide challenges for the industry for who those in charge of producing because they need to make a they need to change their mindset on how to do it differently otherwise if they don't they will be they will drop out of the market so it's a reinvention of the companies of businesses and i think there's we already start to see that i have the opportunity of working with companies who have been very traditional in the department of antioquia specifically here in colombia they start talking about innovation new products on how to communicate differently it's also true that sustainability is is changing and by that point sustainability will lose that romantic idea on the uh, environment but they will begin understanding that as long as things are done right the environmental issue is is a plus it's like a rebound effect i do it well now i don't want to have to be thinking how to control pollution because that which i did well will eliminate many issues of uh, pollution it's more of a consequence than a measuring parameter exactly also how from the professional standpoint professionals will also begin to shake up a little bit and changing their mindset and thinking well we don't have to engage environmental issues because of regulations but these are a consequence of production what we've talked, for example, of, uh, for a long time of clean production. Don't wait at the end. Don't, don't wait till the end of the process, but plan it from the beginning. I believe that need is more and more evident and more and more welcomed by the industry, but also by consumers. Gloria talks a bit from the consumer. I would like to change from the change of values we need to have as people to reach a circular economy. I would think last week the came out the last year report on climate change and emissions and says that we don't have uh, we don't have to 2030 to change uh, the emissions values, but 17 months, which must turn us much more aggressive towards that change. This must change our behaviors. You mentioned companies are already doing innovation. So here in Colombia, we have, for example, Siembra Viva. We buy organic uh, products and they do cleaner processes. But how many of us uh, don't get mad when we have a fruit that's been, that's been uh, a bit trampled upon that doesn't look as neat as clean? This is a system change because so far we've come from a ca wild capitalist system change. How we will change that uh, system change uh, mindset where, it's, where it becomes the standard of production and inertia, where it's not, uh, well, it's not a name anymore, but it's the values of people that lead it to be the only way of doing it. So we need to act very strongly very firmly from the person's side for our lifestyle to change not for well best or for worse but to preserve our planet i will look at it from that end how with the daily actions instead of coming from Envigado here i uh, my car maybe i go i take the metro and then a bike that will take longer but maybe my niece won't be able to do that in 10 years so it's changing the perspective of horizons i don't know if we'll reach 2050 uh, the way we're going but i would like to see all of us uh, changing from the individual perspective and the market distortions may be removed it's very difficult per to compete against plastic when uh, oil is very is still so much cher so cherished so plastic made of corn doesn't have the same subsidies uh, than plastic made with oil. So there's an issue of strong values 
they need to uh, lead us to change the economical system. So I will make a, a brief halt because Silvia Vargas from the Ministry of Environment and Sustainability is with us. We were uh, expecting uh, her anxiously to have that compliment. Silvia, welcome. Uh, delighted to have you here with us. You got on just on time. We're just getting started. Federico Restrepo from Incapab. Incap, Gloria Restrepo. Catalina Zuluaga. In this first question, what we're engaging is how we imagine ourselves. How do we see ourselves in 2030, 2040, 2050, Latin America, Colombia, our territories, and how that movie has a, how that story has a conversation with circular economy. Is there a transition or where are we standing on that? So if Catalina, can you share with us your vision so you can give us the strategic vision of the ministry? Good morning. I imagine not only Colombia, but Medellin, especially focused as a city that has taken large strides and setting a strong foot on mobility with bikes. The transportation system is very focused on leaving the car, sharing the car uh, when we need it, carpooling. So this will be a city where we will be able to have much less cars and uh, much more, many more options for transportation. Um, Alex says we need to have a change of conscience and that conscious change is being done very firmly. I started engaging this in the company because that change came to me uh, through my daughter. And as Federico said, I'm not thinking about myself, but in my niece, my daughter, my family, because human beings react before loss and before pain. So when I think of my daughter, I'm thinking, what will Antonia live, experience? I have to do something now for this not to happen to her. So I start seeing that when people start owning, they start demanding. The consumer becomes very demanding. So they request of companies, if they will sell us a cake, well, don't, don't sell it uh, in a non-recyclable material package because they're more demanding, because there are more options. So the change, I believe, has already started. Today's awareness is much more, uh, it's much more different. People are going different paths. It's not so much consuming, but the balance of enjoying life Life is also circular. It is a balance. So when we start having that uh, awareness change, we start to apply it. So by then, I think there will be fewer cars. Those there, I imagine them being electric. People will have a different consumption. It's not so much consuming and uh, eliminating waste, but who will reuse this? How was that done? Why? What is this product offering me that without doing a lot of effort, I can do something for my planet and leave my children with something better? Thank you very much, Kata. Silvia, tell us, how do you imagine that 2050? Flying skateboards, <laughs> everything we can imagine. First of all, thank you very much for uh, the invitation, I apologize for the delay. From the Environment Ministry, we conceived 2045. We are already advancing in the, uh, in the compliance with the sustainable objectives and in our strategy of circular economy, which is what, what circular economy requires long term. We see that the car will no longer be a transition, but it will be consolidated in a true model of uh, development and circular consumption will be implied. This has a lot of implications. Being pioneers in Latin America and the Caribbean, having this circular economy, we believe we will be leaders in terms of circular economy, which is also going through that learning curve because even though we have international reference such as europe we have our own characteristics in the country some complexities for example recyclings here that are not in other countries in the world 
and but that we incorporate it in our industrial processes. So being leaders of an inclusive work that is migrating by including elements of co-design where I joined Catalina, transportation will be much more sustainable. Trans there will be uh, hybrid transportation, but focused in the electric. Cities play a very important role, uh, and I join with the consumer as well. So in this sense, cities like Medellin in the country will be a true lab of sustainable consumption. And citizens will start generating different dynamics in the market and establishing the threshold on consumption. And this will raise in us an awareness to even pay more for what we're paying for the sustainability that implies. I also imagine uh, ecos uh, ecosystemic services much more conserved where the capacity of regeneration of those systems as we consider in circular economy will be in a capacity of assimilating wastes we add to it because they will be in lesser measure but also to subminister what we need for economy to flow so in that sense i believe the country will be leading circular economy in the region this is great because whoever's listening to this, I believe they're already sensing a revolution. There are many urgent challenges, as Federico said, because we're not talking about years, but months. But we also have the capacities, the conviction to start. Obviously, we will start generating mechanisms, regulations, and all of the sector dynamics that this implies. I would like to ask Federico something uh, very interesting I read in one of his blogs you were mentioning uh, Professor Stevenson from Harvard with a great sentence I would like you to talk about that because I believe this is a way of inspiring all of us who are thinking on implementing circular economy and innovation I think you're talking about the impact uh, entrepreneurial impact block and as the professor in Harvard says, is doing what you can with what you have, not necessarily starting a company, but with, with whatever you have around you. And I think this goes way beyond uh, entrepreneurship being the impact of Transformation Columbia because it will change concept and the way we understand the world. Thinking that companies not only need to generate economical impact for their owners, but also need to generate social benefit and environmental benefit for all. And this is the point on how we teach people since they're little to do what they can with what they have around them. I had the opportunity, I'm in love with the Amazon, so every time I can I go, I've been there with the uh, fires, the Amazons in, in good times and bad times. And it was very hard because I had to go to a, to a monkey uh, Mankey Sanctuary where they came all, all burned up from the f fires. So if in schools, for example, they taught us the myths and legends of the Amazon, we would take care of nature in a much more aware, way, conscious way. So what are we doing with the Amazon for it to be an asset and not just a forest that 80% of Columbians don't even know about? So as Colombians, we need to rethink that. I believe that within the region, we have cases on what we can do. Where you mentioned Colombia can be a leader. I think we're very far away of being leaders because we only recycle 8% and we're thinking to, recy to be recycling 17% by 2030. Costa Rica is already recycling 17%. So how do we, will we become leaders by having more aggressive goals from the movement that will generate disruption, but because we cannot continue thinking, we'll go from one to two, because that, that will not be enough. We need to think of an ecosystemic effort where I can work with Vrika and both of us scale its model. As I understand this uh, table has no glue or anything, but how me from in Impact Hub or other ecosystem, uh, entrepreneurship propel what she's already doing not for personal gain but for an ecosystem uh, gain so i can't think i can't think of recycling from 8 to 17 in 30 years 
in 20 years, but I should be thinking from 8 to 17 percent by next year. But if we're doing that, I don't know if we'll reach the hydrogen cars or flying cars, but I think we need to think in an ecosystem. How do we come together and strengthen what we have to do? And I put this on the table, this is what I can do, that we may all uh, contribute for impact, not thinking individually, but joining. I think there are some signs here in Medellin that that's already happening, but I think we need to be much more aggressive in attacking that types of those types of issues. So I think Colombia needs to have a, a circular economy strategy, but it falls short for the needs the world has, especially considering Colombia could have could be a leader from the natural resources it has in the world. So if we understand that we already have that capital. How can we group everything that's got to do entrepreneurship, circular economy around that capital so we don't go from 8 to 17, but 100%. Uh, as for the gas companies in Bogota, if they already thought about biogas, everything Bogota uh, generates in waste could be, uh, could be redirected to biogas and used in homes. So we have not thought about that. So we need to be more aggressive in solutions, in engaging solutions that have not been thought. We have been following the European model, but what if we follow the European model thinking in our capacities? I think you touched on a couple of points we touched on yesterday. One is fear. And two is taking decisions, decision making in taking risks or aiming and more development, but fear cannot no longer paralyze us because the need is much greater. There can be some goals that can be uh, short. For I could seem as if they fall short now. They could be more aggressive, but I think the message is we cannot wait for someone to tell us what the goal is in order to get start. Us in the world of entrepreneurship, we understand that, and every day we we go out on the field to play it all out for that. So here we're at a table where, where we can share those visions and start generating those challenges. So from our trench, start generating joint solutions and concerted solutions. So uh, uh, going on that closing, Gloria, on the industrial sector, the goal is here, maybe it should be more aggressive, more challenging. So in your experience, what's going on today in different sectors and different chains? We're now wrapping up a project with Colombia Productiva, Productive Colombia, with 20 companies in circular economy, where we're basically working with three productive centers, plastic, textile, and construction. What we find is that the concept of circular economy comes here, but the thing is companies are already doing circular economy. The consumer itself went to the companies to create different systems, to see the system in a different way. Personally and professionally, what am I questioned is that we should not continue thinking of recovering and recycling and thinking about waste, but we should rather be thinking on, you know, what's done is done but how to build on what's done and how to use that knowledge the companies already have that those people who are there already have to start leveraging different developments. Also to join those synergies and bond those synergies. For example, the issue of recycling. It's how do we stop thinking because I believe the country is not moved towards a recycling talked about in circular economy. Circular economy talks about recycling to keep the value of the product, to keep that product in circulation. But what I see is that strategies are not generated for that product to keep its value, but for that rather for that product to start falling and falling and falling, dropping and dropping to reach a different cycle. So I respect the fact that we need to do new products, that everything needs to be compostable, biodegradable. In the specific case of plastic, plastic is one, it's a, is a required product. 
it's very difficult to conceive the world without plastic. Plastic is not the problem. Us, the consumers, are the problem. Those who design products are the problem. Because they're always thinking. I know that behind this are very important economical issues. Because down the line, there's there's uh, competition, how to produce better economics, but also how to have incentives in a measure that when that circularity is produced, eliminating certain toxics, toxic materials for, with different designs, where, where raw materials, more simple raw materials are promoted uh, to be a part of that circularity uh, can come to fruition. This has already been seen in industry. I know plastic industry that has already started thinking not to talk about uh, poly layers, but mono layers, which are simpler processes. And how do we contribute to that? Now, the other element from the perspective of circular economy is that by selling that concept of circular economy, we forgot to sell the fact that each company or each producer has a different role within that context. Some will have the role of producing raw materials with certain qualities to guarantee that whoever uses them can close that circle. But what's been expected or what people conceive is that if I do circular economy, I have to close everything. Companies don't have that reach. So in the measure where barriers uh, are eliminated in technical issues, where there are very important barriers to be able to close uh, circles and cycles. So there's a point where the system breaks because there's no way to close it, specifically because of those technical regu regulatory issues, but also f of design. This is a responsibility of all where a lot are already doing for for circular economy not to be a green become a greenwashing but going to what truly circular economy is and if we need to think of ways to get it think about it but for what's already done but for what's coming ahead is to make a very high bet on what's innovation in products and design I think this is the baseline for this to work. Otherwise, we will always be thinking on how to recycle. And finally, down the line, the issue of fear, specifically in the topic of plastic, is everything will be um, plastic and plastic and more plastic. For example, wood plastic is the solution for the plastic sector. So what happens here? There are many elements where you say this will be the solution but when you start seeing the background of that it will it's not the solution but it will be a means to produce more plastic wood so how can we start thinking in incentivizing in promoting this innovation companies want to innovate they have innovated but they get stuck in in simple points such as we have no lab there's no lab accessible to them, for example. So in order to do some testing, when they have new formulations in plastic, they need to use their whole plant, which implies that one sample needs to be over a, a ton of plastic. This goes beyond every proportion and costs and the capacity of power plants. So who has these capacities? Universities do. But universities are really active two or three months of the year because they're either in vacation. So then to articulate the issue of contracting takes an extra month. So there are really two or three months uh, of effective. So this is a complaint of the plastic sector. We want to do that a lot. We have these formulations, but we have no one to do it. And when we have find someone to do it, a simple testing such as an extrusion cost four or five million pesos. So there are a series of barriers 
where a lot of uh, limitations are generated. But it is clear that the sector is doing many efforts where the industry is already starting to have conversations among them, saying that you don't need to take it to a recycling point, but let's talk you and I. I will receive, I will receive what you're not using and start uh, using, starting with those synergies. So there are advancements, very interesting ones. Another thing that we need to keep working about is how do they communicate with each other and how they transfer knowledge. There are some companies that show progress, but it's but they're not communicating their success stories to other businesses. And and when they share knowledge, they don't share it with the appropriate companies who could use that knowledge. Talking about secondary economy, I'm a an environmental engineer. Started. It, the environmental issue started, this whole process started in, in the environmental concern, but the focus uh, is it should, of circular economy is design and control. So an environmental engineer might lack the skills to be able to promote certain projects. So my concern is who is getting the information and who's leading this transition. I'm not saying that the environmental era is not important. Of course it is, because there are many environmental concerns that need to be communicated and its impacts. But we need to really think about at the economy level. We need to have an economy that generates multiple impacts, the most important one of which is the environmental impact. As I mentioned, we can't, we have to go beyond tr trying to control our environmental impact, but start start thinking about preventing the need for that control from the very beginning and the design. I believe that you are mentioning three very important points. One of them is that circular economy is not a single person's job. This is an articulated work, multi-sectoral work. I don't need to close all the loops. There might be multiple stakeholders helping me close the loops at different stages of the value chain. I believe uh, that uh, this also happens in Me Mexico. They were complaining that universities were researching things that were not relevant for the industry. So there's a misalignment or lack of uh, alignment between programs and funds and the people that need solutions right now. And the third point that you mentioned is that these initiatives are typically fostered through government departments or environmental organizations when the central promoter should be the the business and the economy. Obviously, the environmental expertise needs to be part of it, but it's not the one leading, shouldn't be the one leading, because as I mentioned yesterday, circular economy is not a an activist's uh, activity. No, it's, it's a regenerative model of economy. So it, if the producer and the business and economy is not the one leading, it won't work. So you mentioned multiple times the, the word design. I, I believe in me to understand that the uh, circular economy is not only recycling. The recycling model that we know in Latin America today comes from the linear model of economy. This is a system that will perpetuate circular economy, right? We need to have a transition, obviously, from where we are, but we need to start definitely designing to prevent recycling. So, Catalina, what would you say do we need to do at the design level? I believe it's not just thinking about uh, how to make it easier to disassemble the, the products, but you also need to design products to change people's behavior. A behavior that, as Federico mentioned, sometimes is difficult to change because we have been trained by the previous linear model. Okay, I've noticed a few things that uh, we have different backgrounds in this uh, discussion table that might be able to give advice to the government. The first thing that I see is that as a mom, we should teach our young ones from a very early age that uh, they shouldn't try to compete, they should try to cooperate we're not being taught this. We're being taught how to be the best, how to be the winner, instead of trying to have a, a balanced life. 
currently people don't have balanced lives. We don't have time for friends or for family. We're really chasing our own success, financial success. So we're teaching them the wrong ideas. We're teaching them you should be financially successful, you should have a good job, uh, earn money. So what that leads to is that we consume money and then waste. We consume products and then waste. So the first thing that we need is to educate kids from a very early age that it's cooperation, not competition. And second is also a very early uh, lesson. Use kids to influence the other generations, right? Tell them from very early ages that plastic perhaps is not bad. They should tell their parents that. So uh, the other thing is that uh, I believe the most important thing in, in circular economy is design. Every single product starts with design. Whenever you are in a company and you're design, you, you're going to create a, a product. You start with design. Um, industrial engineers take care of design. As a as a me owner, I realize that one thing is what you want to achieve. Another is reality. Right? You have deadlines. You have uh, fixed costs that you need to cover. And since I don't have enough resources to allow me to implement, you're kind of uh, taking care of small fires or small problems or uh, small fixed costs that prevent me from trying new things. So we also need a little bit more help from other sources, or a lot, I would say, for, from the government sector. Because if, they, if companies have incentives by the government and we start having a little bit more financial leeway, plus the empowerment that we have from this knowledge, and perhaps help from experts, it might be done. Definitely, as uh, SMEs, it's difficult for us to find the time and the financing to implement these ideas that we want to bet, bet in. And so as a company, we have been doing the same thing for 10 years. Our standards are haven't changed. We basically aim for a very simple pro product, sophisticated. How we do that has never been our concern. A little while ago, two or three years ago, we started feeling the call uh, from Kevin de Cuba and Circular Economy. Started mentioning these things to me and I started feeling that it was my responsibility for my profession, for my company, I had to take action. Then thinking about my own kid, I felt that I needed to guarantee her own welfare in the future. So I started questioning myself about how can, through my company, I can use my knowledge and my company and my uh, footprint to contribute or to at least foster change. So for the last two years, we've been trying really hard help from the universities. We've been trying to do prototype projects, trying here and there. And what we're doing now is we're creating a new line of products called ProLab. What we're trying to do with this product line is we're trying to close the loop ourselves because if this happens so naturally out there in, in life, for example, with biomimicry, where you can copy the simple lessons in nature to prevent harming nature. So taking that inspiration, I, I try to figure out how to bring all those insights, uh, creating a very simple product that has has no, basically has no screws, has no glues. This table right here is completely disassemblable. Uh, you can disassemble it very easily. Can we actually take it apart? Let me show you. We can actually remove this piece. So what happens is, right now we have a triangular table, but if I remove the corners, I have a rectangular table. It measures 170. If I remove these other sections on the sides, it's a one, 150 centimeter, 150 centimeter table. So it's basically very modular. It can be a, a dinner table, it can be a, a coffee table. So what we're doing right now is that we're using we're using wood that's sustainable. This wood is not virgin forest wood. It's uh, sustainable forestry wood, and we have sourced this wood 
from companies and we make sure that uh, our associates or our partners are cultivating their their wood we're using teak and we're using acacia so we're basically forming partnerships with sourcings of wood that are uh, green conscious and ecology conscious so right now this table is very modular and can change its functions if i change uh, its legs for shorter legs it can be a, a coffee table for example So other concepts that we've implemented in uh, this eco design line is inspired in Lego bricks. Basically, we are creating easily assemblable and disassemblable pieces. If you can see back here, we have an auxiliary table, but if I add a few pieces, it can become a bench. So multifunction products are easily disassemblable. Now, if I stack multiple benches, I might have a library. So what we're trying to find is creative ways to use and reuse and modularize our design. So if a client you know, uh, stops using one of the products, he can reinvent it. We also sell uh, the promise of multiple uses to the client. If you, we tell them, if you buy this component or this product, later on you might modify it modularly. Another thing that we're doing with customers is that at this day and age, people don't really need to own their goods. And the economic model is changing towards service-oriented businesses instead of cons consumer or consumer businesses or good goods that are owned. They can just lease products instead and since people are have are less rooted they like to travel they like to change houses so we consider that uh, leasing furniture was also uh, an interesting business option we're also monitoring the products that are consumed from our company because it improves the chances of cycling uh, the materials. So if I get back some materials from my clients, um, I can reincorporate them or cycle them in my production cycles. Let's assume that this piece, for some reason, didn't reach me, didn't reach my company back as a responsible company. Well, that's okay because this is just wood painted with natural pigments and safe paints. So if this eventually reaches the ecosystem or a landfill, it will degrade naturally. Like, So cost-wise, what does it mean, Carolina? Because you find that, uh, I think you mentioned this, Federico. Somebody mentioned the, the topic of costs. So if as a, if as a client, I start using these products that uh, are environmentally conscious, it will be more expensive for me. A few days ago, I was very surprised to realize that uh, Indigo Reciclado, a company that ha is very environmentally conscious, said to me, they said, we're just as competitive as using virgin materials or even more competitive. So econom uh, talking about f financially, it, can you actually lower the prices of your, of your products by doing this? For a few years, we've worked for uh, the social status, uh, status uh, sector of the city, five or six. At first, I didn't really know what my potential market was. Uh, at first, I just decided to uh, market my products across the people that I knew. What we're trying to achieve is products that are eco-friendly, but that look like sophisticated products that look great, that looks great, that's sophisticated, that it's very... Uh, it generates a lot of appeal for the customer. Since we were trying to right, uh, reach high-end customers, price was not a concern. Okay, so if you're in that market, that's not a concern. That market uh, allows you to uh, charge high prices. What happens 
if you come up with a non-traditional product in that market? What would the, be the cost difference in that same market? I'm not talking about uh, changing your market niche to try to sell to uh, customers of less, less income. Now, let's say you have uh, a product that costs 3 million COP. Let's say that in that market, you create a different design. Will that impact the price? Will it increase the price or lower the price? No, it, it won't increase the price. We do, we do very personalized businesses. We used to do very personalized businesses, but by with this um, green line, we are trying to modularize design. This is built using CNC technology, and this allows us to lower the cost and create a much more precise fitting. So I, I talk, I talk about costs because when we talk about design, we consider different materials, perhaps replacing chemicals. Maybe we're going to have to increase our cost base and you're going to lose competitiveness. But not really. You find examples like yours where you find a way to use design intelligently. You choose your suppliers very intelligently and you can keep costs of the product and offer a green line that is not more expensive and then costs don't become a barrier and the myth that uh, because of product the myth, this myth that says that because a product is reusable and recyclable then it will cost more is busted i do believe that that's a myth and we've busted that myth in practice in fact i think that we can lower our uh, our, our cost uh, the cost of our products if if we're careful what it is very uh, costly is the prototyping procedures because we've for a few years we had to look for the right technology and the CNC machines and right so you we used to we used to um, make our products with basically by hand and now look at this product that are so perfectly designed uh, so perfectly built uh, by using CNC technology. So basically the initial uh, upfront cost requires a lot of money from the entrepreneur and sometimes we don't have that leeway. I mean, I'm passionate about this and if, if I could, all my products would be green, but I can't really do that. So I believe that we need a little bit of more, a little bit more financial leverage. Like Gloria mentioned, perhaps some community labs for prototyping so that we are being held by Proto, Proto Parque from Sena Institution. But I do, I do feel that we need some financial resources to be able to implement all the lines that we want. And then, of course, every, every single furniture in, in the departments, in the ministry departments of the government should be green. I'm really surprised by these beautiful designs that you've, uh, you've worked so hard on. There's something important I would like to say. I didn't invent this design. This type of joint was not invented by our company. We're just using old company. I believe that in the end, all we did was change our mindset. In the end, I want to go back to the basics. And the basics are this. This fittings, if we incorporate these fittings into our current models, everything can be done without uh, glue or without screws. This table right here uses no screws, no glue, and it's just using uh, old style fittings. So all we really need companies is, at least in mine, is to be able to research and to be able to come up with a design that, that works and is built consciously. We also need to believe in local so sources of raw materials. Because for example, you're competing with international monsters. So when you, when you're required, So Colombian entrepreneurs have great ideas, but perhaps the market doesn't embrace those ideas. The market will only believe in those ideas when they succeed in other markets and they're willing to try it. So it's very important to understand how we Colombians start preferring Colombian products uh, over American products or other. 
The other thing I'm going to consider is how do we market this product? I believe that this is a very broad transformation that requires very detailed changes. One of the important things to consider is how do you market this new product lines? Outside markets might have a different uh, awareness. Perhaps we need to change our discourse or the way we market things here to make it work in our markets. Sometimes I feel that we as entrepreneurs are kind of expecting a radical disruptive change when we need to go back to the basics. We need to go back to the basics to what has worked in the past. As you mentioned, you didn't invent anything. You didn't innovate anything in your product lines. You just used stuff that already existed. You talked about lots of circular economy principles in a single piece, in a single modular piece of your product. We were talking about furniture here, talking about tables. You used a, a very interesting word, which is my products do not harm nature which I believe we do 90% of the time by the products that we support when, when we go out there and buy stuff. So as a consumer, you might have multiple alternatives with your product just as you do. It might be the same use and just uh, recycling the same product, or it might be because your needs change. Perhaps you, you, were, you were an early mom and then you were the mom of a, of a teenager. Basically, the, the product will be able to evolve with you and with your needs. And the last thing is, how can I cycle this product and returning materials to the company, whether because it was a service or because I'll give you incentives to give back to me so I can re reuse the materials. So we're talking about a completely different market. That market that you talk, talk about is the one that we all want to create. So basically, marketing experts should be here and design experts should be here learning about how are we going to create new products? How am I going to change the behavior of my customers? Who buys from me because uh, it's, it's trendy? So I would like for Sylvia to, to help us understand how should we promote all this? How can that whole micro uh, model uh, and that networking and how these small micro, micro enter, entrepreneurs that create about 60% of uh, employment offers in Latin America, how can we work hand in hand with circular economy what's the bet what do we have to to do for you to f help us because i would like you to design a table where i can help you and where, where we can work hand in hand i love this uh, debate i was making mental notes and trying to remember what everyone was mentioned but basically you're giving me the sense that we're we're on the right path Many of those things that you mentioned are, are part of uh, our national strategy. So first, you were talking about uh, that you're doing things that are not new. And I believe we do that in our national plan. I believe that the strategy, strategy considers things like cleaner production and uh, it, it's related with uh, sustainable development goals. These are policies that we've been working for a very long time. and. Uh, we already implemented them and have measurable results in, in the country. We need to look back, yes. Our minister always mentions it. They men He mentions that circular economy is not such a new idea. And basically, we're trying to integrate all the old ideas. What we really need to do is to implement these things so that these goals become a reality and that transition it becomes a reality. Right? So we're going to the basics. We're going to the reusable uh, baskets to go to the market instead of plastic bags and returnal bottles. We're going back to using lunch boxes. Back in the day when I took uh, you know, juice to school, it was uh, just, uh, just a thermos with a plastic bag uh, to prevent uh, spills. And definitely, you know, Involving our kids is very important because through them, we also change the mindset of older generations. Plastic, for example, is a very difficult thing. Uh, taking plastic out of, out of our lives is very difficult. 
perhaps we should have more aggressive uh, political strategies. As a father, you buy your lunch for your kids and you buy uh, different products that necessarily use, use plastic. So definitely, it's not just innovating, sometimes just uh, going to the basics and replacing things that we don't want, but also how do we value the natural resources that offers so many benefits to us that we can draw value from and in the economy. So this are stuff this is stuff that's already there that we just need to m make better use of. Now talking about recycling. Now the the barriers that we had in recycling made us design a new strategy. We have uh, goals of we have goals to be to be able to reuse waste materials uh, from construction we could reuse about 80 percent but we're only using two we could uh, use or reuse lots of plastic we're only recovering like two percent now now the gap between the goals and the recovery the, the actual recovery goals and the eventual recovery goals is so even though we want to recover about 17 percent of uh, waste using recycling when people talk about circular economy they many people just associate it with resource recovery but it's not just that waste under the right optic is a design flaw so it's not just recycling but changing the mindset and valuing other resources that we just ignore they might even be a headache for certain companies. So how can we create new business models? How can we work with the entire value chain? So all, even though recycling is an important element, it's just a, a piece of the puzzle and a face that's necessary for, for certain goals to, for certain goals. So if you don't recycle properly, you won't be able to recover or if you don't separate at the source uh, then uh, so we definitely need to work on education in older people you know changing older people's mindset is more more difficult asking them to asking them to for example clean uh, the containers to be able to recycle them well, it's, it, so the, our vision is much more ambition than just increasing recycling rates so including the three R's, recycling, recovering, and reusing. And we also need to talk about something that's a little bit difficult, which is uh, design obsolescence and how uh, political guidelines can foster this to happen for products to be able to have multiple life cycles. Part, that's part of what we're working on. That's part of our vision. We understand that transition is not easy, it's hard. So we have short term goals that are aligned with the current government period, but they're looking also uh, on the long term to 2030 for the sustainable development goals. Innovation is absolutely necessary for us to be able to achieve this. It's one of the necessary drivers, innovation and technology. Sometimes it's difficult to, act, to be able to access or benefit from technologies because they're outside technologies. But sometimes we can compensate it with human capital. Why don't we design this technology here ourselves? Some of those sectors have been able to achieve this. So that's another uh, thing that we want to work on. Alliances between academia and the businesses for us to be able to empower each other. And what you mentioned also help for businesses to be able to close cycles with support from the academia and uh, research. I actually worked in Colciencias, our National Science Research Foundation. And I used to see multiple research projects that are misaligned with national objectives of, of economy or eco-friendliness. So right, we're design, right now we're designing a strategy where we are trying to create research Research, research projects that um, face those challenges. We also have a national network of universities. 
This week, on November 29th, 28th, we're doing uh, national workshop, workshops to reach different regions. This week, we had this program, which was uh, aimed at universities and uh, research programs. Unfortunately, we had to cancel the, the event uh, because of a national directive, but we'll reactivate it next year. But that's uh, an important bit that for universities and the academia to start betting on circular research projects so that technology and innovation can, local innovation can help to solve local needs. Another important idea for the ministry is that uh, circular economy is not a, an idea of one person or one industry or one company. We try to foster cooperation and networking between stakeholders so that the problems that businesses are have can be solved within the network of businesses through cooperation. And this cooperation process involves other elements like logistics or being able to design these companies so that uh, they have a smaller footprint in transporting uh, services. So everything requires a little bit of design, but we're definitely convinced that uh, networking and uh, business partnerships are very important. Trying to break down barriers is one of the things that we're very committed to right now. We've done more than 17 national workshops. It's not just government regulations. That's why we've visited more than 18 municipalities. None of the main cities of the country. We've gone to Mocoa, Buenaventura, and to many others that are very vulnerable and have many needs to be able to first learn from the regions to know what they're doing. What are they doing in circular economy in those regions? So what are their initiatives? Also to assess the barriers or the difficulties that they've found whenever they've tried new prototypes or new implementations. So we're basically making a small database of barriers, cultural barriers, communication barriers, government barriers, financial barriers. We're trying to learn from the experiences of our regions. That's our, that's our reference to be able to design our policy from the government side. So although I'm working for the Ministry of the Environment, we're also working with the Ministry of Tourism, but it's really a national bet. The, the Ministry of Energy and Ministry of Education are also involved and the Ministry of Housing. This is a topic or that touches different areas. So we're trying to articulate our efforts from the government. So we're, we're leading it because it has environmental measurable results, but we also have to work with the Ministry of Education. You mentioned, for example, that you're working with Colombia Productiva. That's part of uh, the support that the national government is offering. In terms of communication, we're working on how to make those strategies visible, working with the different sectors. And we're doing a job that's taking a bit longer than expected, but it's generating a platform for circular economy for the country to put the, all the information at their service, to have even a platform of offer and demand in terms of circular economy. We're working on that. And we're working on a portfolio for circular economy in different prioritizations and also a bank of technologies because it is also important to show what some companies are doing in terms of technology application, how that can be replicated in other scenarios in other industries. I don't know if something escapes my mind, I took some mental notes, but yes, one more thing, mechanisms. Yes, that's where I was going as well. As for mechanisms, it entails everything I've been sharing, but for us to bet together in this transition, we have identified some mechanisms that will take circular economy to be a reality. One of them is regulations, because regulations are designed for linear economy, so it needs to change forcefully so it doesn't become a barrier on circular economy. Uh, 
an example, for example, the regulation for the uh, water waste management and water uh, reutilization. So we're working on that. As for mechanisms, more on working with, uh, say now with Colciencias, different universities, research centers, to mobilize knowledge and resources towards research in circular economy. Another mechanism is cooperation in terms of industrial symbiosis, as I mentioned, but also the cooperation we're searching from the government standpoint to leverage circular economy. So we have strong allies such as the European Union who has helped us in certain areas, but also embassies such as the Netherlands and other countries betting for circular economy. And because they're uh, importers and exporters to Colombia, they see themselves as part of uh, the same chain, so we need to work together in circular economy as part of it. And others were the which are more critical is the creation of incentives and financial instruments. How the ones that are exi already existing or the ones we will create, how do we have those resources, uh, leverage new entrepreneurs, SMEs, new projects. So we're working with Finete, Bancoldex, Impulsa Colombia Productiva, and different banks in the country, state and private banks, to generate lines of credit. We're even thinking of compensated tax, uh, compensated rate uh, incentive with the agricultural bank. But this is a uh, short and medium term projects to work in those mechanisms. So as I was listening to you, I think we're not we're not erring uh, off the target. Uh, it takes time, it's a job that takes time, but I want to express that we're, we're right on it. And a circular economy is something we're transitioning to. Especially in this last uh, part of aspect of mechanism, which is the one that allows for it to happen or not, uh, all the others are objectives, intentions, orientations, but if the mechanism is not in place, all of this we're imagining will hardly take place. And I talk from all three standpoints, all three perspectives. Today, in a very concrete manner, how could the ecosystem entrepreneurship and many needs for financing and growth, etc., the SME sector, which has innumerable challenges and the great uh, uh, corporate business people. How can we strengthen some, accelerate others' uh, uh, processes and articulate each other? What's that mechanism? What incentives, what finances? To your question, I would like to add, it's not so much the needs of the entrepreneurship ecosystem, but I don't see mechanisms that uh, propel. Yes, there are needs for financing, but I think these hurdles can be overcome if there was if there was a mechanism in place to help overcome those. But as long as regulations allow for certain things in great on large entrepreneurs to continue succeeding, then the small entrepreneur will hardly, the SME entrepreneur will harder, hardly overcome hurdles and survive. There's a barrier that won't allow him to go in. For example, in terms of electric mobility, there are regulations who favor great producers, large producers, but what are we doing for them to there to be local solutions to manage things? So what is already going on is a matter. You're talking what is being planned, what will be vision, when will uh, planning come over when, when Duque finishes his pres presidency, what mechanisms are already set in place that potentiate what's going on, but not that absorb needs. Because looking at the entrepreneurship ecosystem, we see every day, for example, sustainable clothing brands for plastic brands. There are, there are many here. But how do we stop Sada to continue selling at their price for the Colombian companies to start selling and competing? Every Colombia has many entrepreneurships, but how 
are we regulating that everything that's been financed abroad doesn't come into our country on prices that kill the national industry? So it's not the needs, it's more the regulation in place that, that is not set in place to strengthen the national product that already exists. So what already exists today to potentiate the national products that already comply with environmental regulations to move ahead uh, of practices uh, that you mentioned. For example, Margarita can see us having uh, paper packs from 1990 we can find. That's a design error. When will, when will we uh, re start restricting those design errors to come in here in Colombia? I believe some of the elements are not only an issue of small companies, but the medium and large national company also suffer from that. I have to say, I have not worked with Fabricato, but Fabricato has done a very high bet to produce recycled products. In these projects, they have like five references, I think. They have made a very high bet to research, make a recirculation of water. They have transformed their processes very efficiently. But what you say, the international market makes it very difficult for them to stay alive. And this is not only at a micro level, but medium and large companies as well. Yes, indeed, Fabricato, I know it. These jeans I have on are made of plastic and I got it from Focus Green because the Colombian market, which is from the States, because the fo national uh, focus of Colombian companies cannot compete. So yes, this is the reality we're facing. There are a lot of people, a lot of knowledge around, moving around, a lot of processes. How can we make this to be the 2020, 2021? Some things are certainly ready to launch. Others will be more long term, but also from the ministries or government, they may see that there's an open uh, table for conversations. You said there's an IBIMA process that needs to change in their, in their um, drafting. In Mexico, we have the same problem where a small class doesn't allow a revaluing of a lot of uh, waste, where I'm talking tons and tons per year. Maybe it's not the financing, as in I give you the money, but I do help you to accelerate, to scale up, that you have a market to... Uh, cover you more i think that's the greatest challenge now the question i need to drop it for whoever wants to take it is within this uh industry 4.0 the fourth re fourth revolution is here whether we want to uh, see it or not some see it from automated automation and robots uh substituting people but it also can be printers different designs that facilitate uh, design and development how is industry 4.0 being seen regarding in circular economy 4.0? Is it a driver? Is it a driver? Is it a challenge? Is it a problem? How do you see it? I would say it needs to be a propeller, but we have to see that the uh, fourth rev industrial revolution here in Medellin, nothing is happening here, nothing has been happening for the past four years. Now Mexico and San Pablo and San Pablo in Brazil are very large, more strengthened ecosystem moved ahead and we moved from first to third place now because we didn't do it on time. So now we're at the center and this fourth industrial um, the fourth industrial revolution here cost one million dollars to the government and one million to the local government and what has come out of that not much really i'm sure if you talk to the thousand allies the economical for financial world forum a lot of things come out of that but we take a lot of time to see who will be the leader who will be the team so the short-term results of this fourth industrial revolution center will be delayed. I think there's a lot of strength because there are urban challenges that can be solved for mo intelligent mobility, intelligent cities from this forest revolution without fearing automation. 
because down the line, automation has occurred in many periods of history, and people has not uh, uh, was not left out of work, but they just migrated to other sectors. I think it's not fearing automation, but rather accelerate this change so the change doesn't run us over, but that we potentiate uh, this change in our favor. So I think we are at the center of the fourth industrial revolution. How is the national government using that? And how as citizens are we having those uh, investments propelled? And how are large companies using this fourth center, the center of fourth uh, industrial revolution with entrepreneurs, with companies? The large company will not solve everything. They don't have the capacity or mechanisms to do it. So insert an entrepreneur that will use your labs, the prototypes be done together. I think it is a propeller, but I think it's a matter of swiftness and political decision. I don't govern for four years, but we may to have our mayor be much larger than our breath. Whatever I have, whatever, how long I have for a period cannot detect my policies, but my policies need to be managed far beyond my the term. So what am I doing now as a mayor and governor for the next mayor governor to capitalize on that? Yes, I believe there are a lot of challenges in terms of regulations. We found a lot of barriers in this exercise, barriers in materials that come into the country and how to contain others that do not leave. So the raw materials uh, continue propelling the national products. So now working with all and those tasks of negotiating certain tax issues and controls of import and export, you would understand that it takes time. These negotiations need to take place. We need to work on that because we cannot allow materials such as metals and metal waste um, is exported and we need to re-extract virgin raw materials when we have so much that we could use. So how to control others that come in and affect and try to stop the com competition in the country? We're working on that, but designing regulation instruments is not uh, uh, as easy. We're validating the strategy this year for the final version to come out, but it's a work that's been going on for four years. Things are being done. We're already signing interministerial uh, projects with the different sectors to mobilize economy and productive processes towards circular economy. We're also working on uh, tax incentives for electric cars and engaging the, the issues from different uh, angles. We know it takes time. The development of these mechanisms take time. What do I also want to mention? I had middle term because it's planned for next year is to have an incidence in that plans for competitiveness and innovation moved by regional offices, offices of competitiveness and innovation to have circular economy inserted in those plans already by next year. We're doing this from the National Commission of Competitives and Innovation to reach the territories and having it done regional. And this will help uh, dynamize the strategies and measure the advancement. We're already doing a, a diagnosis on how we're doing in Colombia in terms of circular economy to compare ourselves with the European Union and we need to reach those standards. So we are already reaching those levels. One has already been designed at a national level, but we need to bring it down to local level on information systems with the SENA and universities and other means, which are programs of information in circular economy to reach not only entrepreneurs, but also to the NGOs and the citizen, because this is a joint work. 
So this is coming out next year. The formation program as well, the regional program, work through departmental work, and an entire political uh, work designed to include uh, customs tariffs because the public rates uh, for those services and public services uh, will not, as they are today, merge well into uh, circular economy. So working at a national and global, at a national and local government levels. So you as hosts, you might know more than us and your leaders from Ruta N and other entities. But those are the scenarios we want to bring all of these barriers to, we have found to and all the mechanisms established to come out with the ideas quickly and bring them out quickly in the market to bring solutions to your problems and find the exit. From the national level, we do not have all the answers. I'm glad you mentioned it, that go the government doesn't do everything and the companies and entrepreneurs uh, are doing their part. So you can count on these barriers uh, to disappear little by little and you can feed back on our work to change short, medium and long term for this to transcend a four year policies. So what I will do is shift the ball to the other end. Gloria, in your perspective from the large company sectors, because if you are betting for circular economies because you have challenges you can solve and you are losing competitiveness and impact in territory that is translated in waste, in losses, in financial penalties, etc. So from the standpoint of innovation, developing specific solutions the company needs but have not developed because it's not their business core or they don't have an innovation department for that, how can they get connected today? I think there are many solutions, but they are not located where they are or at the scaling level they should have. You have been in those industrial conversations. How can we connect those two points? So first, let's clear out. The work with Colombia Productiva has not only been with large companies. There are medium companies as well, even small companies, I would dare say. What's a key element? It's to understand the role of the medium-sized company, of the SMEs, basically. Large part of raw materials used by large industries comes from those SMEs, SME industries. So we need to start strengthening in a way we feel that there are no spaces where companies can dialogue. Dialogue in a transparent manner. Because when we talk in certain meetings, what they're thinking from the industry standpoint is how can I plagiarize what this one is doing? But there's no real sharing of knowledge with the perspective of Let's grow together a, a network of collaboration, a collaborative economy. Exactly. Some companies uh, get stuck with one vendor and they lose focus on who's doing different things. So those spaces where conversations can start taking place, you do this, this is good for me, this is good for you. These are important the element important is who goes to those meetings. I think the change comes from those who take decisions, from those decision makers from large, medium or small industry companies. Because a lot of times it becomes a commitment where I will send a representative, but that representative doesn't even have access to the manager to say, look, this is what I saw, this is what I have. It's just we attend, we attend, our name shows up and we complied and that's it. 
that's one element. The other element is that we need to unblock technical elements as normative and technical restrictions, but we also need to block others. The thing is weird. Look, when we evaluate the textile sector or the agricultural sector, what we find is that at a global level, there are many restricted chemicals in the European Union, the EPA, but they're being used in Colombia. These are not restricted, but other elements were closing cycles, recovering textiles to produce new textiles is not possible because there's a restriction where that if it's been in contact with a person, then it's an issue of fluids and I don't know what else. I have not seen circular economy in such simple manner, but I will uh, give you this very simple ex uh, example. A colleague said, look, circular economy is simple. There's no simplest economy than a restaurant when they use their plates and cutlery. All, you're constantly washing them and reincorporating them. There's no problem there. So what's the difference with clothing? Use a system that guarantees its de-infection and reincorporate it, certify it even if you wish, but it's a process. But there is a technical limitation that does not allow us to do it, not even that way. So those are two things that go against the current we can use very chemical um, products in terms of laundry, in terms of finishing processes, but the clothing itself cannot, does not have a way of being reincorporated. So I think revisions need to be made for, to reach a congruency. I understand that the process of regulation change is complex, but it is also necessary so we need to look at these processes and see how they can be more nimble for these changes to be faster. Those most limited by all of this is the sector of construction. You were to talking about certain numbers now, 50% that can be re of cement that can be reincorporated. But how will you reincorporate it if you can now basically be done in fillings within construction. Use it for fillings. Use it for sidewalks. But when we need to talk about doing a brick from certain different elements from recycled material, we get so scared, we get freaked out. It's like guarantee the process you will do, you will technically do it in a manageable way and that you comply with safety measures, but allow the industry to do it. Otherwise, the industry will never mobilize because what we find is that, well, you can do it this way. It's like, yeah, why will I do it? If How will I do it if they don't let me? It's the large, larger groups who have some power have been able to generate some change. The clearest case we have is Encade Colombia. They were able to mobilize regulation to reach that point of bottle bottle program. One of the elements in plastic is that recycled plastic cannot be used for any product that gets in touch with food. But the PET is a clear example that it can be done. What we need to review is technological issues when we're talking about uh, Industry 4.0 is that it is necessary to start mobilizing the industry. The issue of employment generation, the company needs to start training whoever will manage all of those instruments for it to be possible. So what we start seeing is that the quality of life of people will surely improve we, they will be more uh, technified, better trained. They have other trades that will be easier to handle and with lower risk. We're going from an economy of manufacture to 
an economy based more in knowledge, which adds much more value. I think that's the bet that has been uh, doing, at least in Medellin, for several years in terms of innovation. And I think this is an inertia we need to get on in Latin America. Now, there's something that's very important. I don't even want to imagine ministries in four years having to review a regulation framework to realize they need to change it, then frame it, and then change it again. So I'll close my idea with this. I know that's a gigantic work, so the question is the other way around. How can we help from where we're standing to dynamize to say, hey, look, for certain plastics and in terms of use, we need to modif modify this regulation, this and that. What I was thinking is that this cannot be a very, uh, very nice conversation table, and that's it, but something needs to come out of here. Gloria will detect certain things, and a direct communicate line of communication needs to be there. Uh, on things she will start finding because there are so many different perspectives. So I need to go with the uh, tablet on my uh, backpack and go to the Afid University and saying that I come on bus and this and that. And but the lines of communication need to be open from here. They're working on it. We're working on it so that we may have open lines of communication. Say, look, I discovered this. And, and and do something about it, otherwise we're wasting time. Yeah, the question is, how can we help you to soften the path for you? Because of a softened path for you is to speed up uh, this path and processes. So we all need to help each other. Yes, and there are a lot of people in it. So let's talk about not only Medellin, but Colombia, Latin America, because at the beginning, of the description of the strategy, you said, you said we want to be leaders of the region, and as such, you need to transfer all of this to the different regions and countries that are part of the region. So how can we dynamize this exercise in the micro to facilitate all the rest? Well, there are several elements there. I forgot to mention something that will help um, bond everything we're talking about we signed a pact with 50 key actors in the country guilds. the main guilds the main ngos all with a joint vision of country and we go to when we go to the territories we have 15 regional pacts for circular economy we signed one for colombia more uh, gilded signatures, more than company signatures, to start working together. But how will we bring down to earth of this? Through local uh, competitiveness and innovation offices, there needs to be certain trust in that, because in our case, for to get to be more competitive, more productive, to improve their indices of performance, this can be a first scenario where everyone is, sits down together and talk not only uh, unions guilds and competitive uh, companies but there are also meetings where there are a lot of wheels and all joining in favor of and towards circular economy an example i would like to share that's very interesting is the network of sustainable companies Redescar because it's in Bogota with the local network and the Redis program is from the Andes University in Bogota who has replicated and transferred the knowledge to other universities in the city and there's the Autonomous Corporation uh, as representative of the government but also many different companies they have multiple work lines a clean production line a certification line, a new line, which is related with water stewardship. They have another one related to industrial symbiosis. These are some of these ecosystems that allow stakeholders to start to transfer and replicate, and they have a very big impact. This is a bed coming from multiple sectors, and coming out of these scenarios, lots of good ideas come. Networking happens. 
you realize there are companies that can become your suppliers. So that type of scenario can be scaled up and replicated in other regions of the country. But we need support from the academia, from the ministry. But these are things that we have already done. We already work with multiple universities. So I believe that that's something that could be done. And what you mentioned about recovering cement uh, waste. Yesterday, I made a technical visit to a small company. It was created in 2016, and they have efficiency standards that are amazing. Even in their physical infrastructure, it is on par with everyone else. I mean, their logistics, decarbonizing, and this is basically a cement producer. What I want to say with this example is that this small industry has achieved all this. They look, um, they aim to use uh, materials, building materials in cities, um, metal scraps, building waste, uh, broken tiles. They incorporate all these potential resources to reduce their clinker use, which has a very big carbon footprint and it has to be imported from far away. This is small companies being able to use all these materials while keeping um, or complying with the safety standards. So it can be done. Small companies can actually uh, innovate and start being able to apply circular economy. Of course, there are other topics that need to be worked on, regulations, and but I would like to tell you that there are things happening. There are small companies that are already doing things. Okay, very well. I believe that the, this table shows that it's very important to network between different stakeholders. It's very important for the ones on this side of the table to share their concerns and their ailments with the others, this other side. We want to help the government help us. Our day-to-day -day faces regulation challenges, and you are the ones in charge of regulation. At the end of the day, circular economy is not about experts. It's about everyone working in favor of changing the production standards. So there's, there's this question that might seem a little bit odd. But uh, social equity and gender e equity, both locally and in the territories, how can we face this challenge from circular economy? Do we need a specific agenda for this, or is it a natural part of the consequences of transitioning to a circular economy? Even though we do have social benefits driven from circular economy, we should have specific... We have, you know, it's, it's specific challenges regarding gender equality and fair jobs. Uh, stop using old technologies to be so how do we combine those two agendas with the agenda of circular economy is it is it possible okay let me let me try to answer that if i had the strategy book here national strategy here you wouldn't find a chapter talking specifically about gender equality and fair work but we're addressing it indirectly. Just to mention a few examples. There's this sentence related to the Atrato River, a river in the Chocó region. You might say, what, what, what does it have to do with circular economy? There is, in fact, a relationship. It might not be that evident, but those that uh, extract natural resources to create handicrafts, perhaps mostly women in small communities. And in some regions and some, some cultures more than others, women are the ones that hold the burden of 
financial responsibility in the household. So there, there's some gender-oriented strategies, some lines more than others. There's not a specific chapter on gender equality, but it's kind of like implicit in the DNA of the decisions that you're making. Let's talk about Mexico. There are many territories in Mexico where 80% of the population is, are women because most men emigrate to the United States. They might not ever come back. And children, men, child, child, children that are males leave the household after 15. So these communities are very vulnerable. So how can we help these communities flourish, help them with a, with a better economic model and perhaps to help them reintegrate their families? This is a reality that might be replicated all over America. I believe that's an important agenda and from innovation and business models, what are we doing? I would like Federico to answer that question because he knows lots of people and they might be able to generate impact there. Before I answer you directly, I want to tell you that I had the opportunity to work with the UN and the Asian Development Bank. And one of the projects that we ran was in Thailandia, which had a very gender specific perspective. And we assessed the impact that we reached and the conclusion was that the gender geared projects have 40% more impact because women tend to share knowledge while men try to keep it for themselves. So I, I wanna be able to tell you how, we, how we're doing in, in those indicators of gender equality, but, but now to answer your question, I think that the national government does have in, the Impulsa organization to tell them statistics about how many entrepreneurship projects are headed by women, and they might be able to tell whether they have a, an inclusive gender strategy or not. I don't really have the figures for our own incubator program about gender equality, but perhaps the ministry could make a survey uh, about it in dif different incubator projects. Usually are the small entrepreneurs, the new entrepreneurs, the power of ideas are so big that they're the ones that will influence the regulations of the government. Sometimes they, they don't even know how to regulate. So what we need is political will to help us foster the changes that we need. I do believe that there are women that are succeeding in this entrepreneurial uh, sphere. It is, we have to recognize that the entrepreneurship uh, scenario is a, a little bit of a macho scenario. In some ways it is not meant for for women. If you go to networking events, you, you see mostly men as entrepreneurial leaders. I believe that the Eafit principle, at the first of this year, he mentioned a statistic that uh, from around 100% of women that uh, graduate, only 3% of them become entrepreneurs. In, around 20% st stop pursuing their professional career and become housewives. I'm not saying that's good or bad. What I'm saying is what, why are we educating women who take those choices, right? I would think that uh, how many presidents of the Antioquia business group have been women, for example, or on the other side, what is the system doing for them to favor uh, pursuing a housewife career. I mean, being with your kids is not a bad thing. Perhaps these women are not finding a way to combine both things, a professional career and taking care of their children. And they're forced into, at some point, making a hard choice and deciding that uh, they'll basically, at this point of my life, I will devote myself to my kids. So. Yeah, I think that we're transferring the burden on the on the women. I mean, w women cho chose their family, but what? Why can't men take that choice? Huh? Why are we letting the woman make that choice? Why is she having to sacrifice her career? Why not the men? What are we doing in the system for the woman to make the choice that the men are taking right now to empower her in a way? So uh, I pose the question again: How many women have been presidents of the? Antiochian business group, none. And not just the Antiochian business group, 
think about many other business groups, Sarmiento Angulo, and in the many business conglomerates, how many of the CEOs of companies have been women? We have very low representation. So I believe that there's a systemic issue here where we're kind of forcing women to make the choice whether if you want to choose your family or your professional career. So I do believe that systemically, or we, we need to empower women much more. Well, Ter Terpel, the, the, the oil and gas company, within a sphere of industry which is completely man-driven, uh, man is a woman, Silvia. And since she took the job, the post, she started making lots of uh, environmentally conscious uh, policies. So it gives an example where when a CEO took over a company, they became more conscious and started taking care of the, of the planet. Why do we need more diversity? Because we all have different perspectives and different opinions, and nature gives us a different... Right? Our nature gives us a different vision as men and women. Right? So it's a mom's woman. It's a, it's a woman's vision. I would like to talk about education. We're, in education, we're taught to work, to get money, to consume. But lately, I've realized that life is more of finding a balance. But these companies, in the end, are requiring so many work hours from women. It's not so much that men are forcing us to make that choice. It's that when we make the choice of becoming mothers, at some point, you look at your child and you wonder to yourself, what's the point of having a kid if I have to work all the time and never share with it? with her. So, so in a way, my priorities become my family. It's a very natural choice. It's, I mean, I love being an entrepreneur and teach and share knowledge, but at some point my daughter looks at me and she says to me, mom, is today a work day for you or a family day for you? And she just disarms me and questions me. I believe that many big companies have made a call for for companies to have small um, daycare centers within the companies for women to be able to go to work without leaving their children behind, behind, right? So we do have to consider that. And when you talk about that, you always talk about women making that choice. What I'm saying is, why don't men have to question themselves making that same choice? No, no, what I'm saying is that in the case of women, we, we are making the choice. In my case, it works the other way. I'm the one working in the household and my, my, my husband it takes over the, the household. I believe that many couples have made that choice. I do believe it's, uh, it's a, it, our, our nature as women influences us more to choose family over work. I do know many women who have worked, have, have had a very long successful career, and when they have children, they decide, you know, to to give it give it away and stay with families. So that's great to know that that's happening because, as men, we've always um, been told. Society has been telling us that that uh, your value is your success financially, in a way. The other thing that we need to see whether uh, the, the systems that uh, companies offer to women for them to have an alternative of being a, a family a family mom and also an employee. How many companies uh, kind of consider twice hiring women because they might ask them for a for pregnancy license? One thing is, uh, let's just see the, the historical data and see whether or not it's true that uh, a 30 years old, 30, 30, 40 years old woman is given the same options uh, when they're at the very peak of their professional uh, efficiency. I would like to add something to be able to close the, the gender topic, and it's something very positive, which is that we are three women and a single man in this in this table. So we have gender superiority here. Hey, what about me? I'm a man too. You're leaving me out. So we have three women talking about circular economy 
women who are also entrepreneurs and business owners. So I believe that we are breaking into the market of men. And when I came to Colombia to work for the first time, the thing that I liked the most, we had much more executive uh, posts being filled by women. And as far as sustainability and circular economy, I also see that there's lots of awareness and many women taking part of the discussion and um, I guess that in the end, women have many capabilities and skills that we don't. And unless we help them to join in, we won't be inclusive. Perhaps the male's perspective of the world is so different from women's that we need their, their alternative approach and perspective. So I gave you this question, the, the topic about gender. Many of you talked about gender from, from the point of view of, of businessmen and businesswomen. But there's another side of the question. Regardless of whether posts are filled with men or women or you have the gender quotas 50-50 in, in a company. About marketing, are we trying to be inclusive? And I don't just refer to gender because when I, when I talk about mobility, we need to also uh, see it from the gender perspective side. So that, does the strategy consider that everything that we are developing will bet for inclusive, uh, for, for gender inclusive policies? I would also add something else. That inclusion does also consider for small, medium and big companies to work in that synergy that we've talked about to be able to achieve circular economy or do, or do certain sectors of the business market have specific opportunities. We're talking actually about expanding the economy because uh, circular economy expands the possibility of business models. My question is, are we considering the idea that uh, producing these new products and these new business models will uh, actually help the city be more inclusive, gender inclusive? I don't know about the first co-working in Medellin who has a, a daycare center uh, in, its in, in, its, uh, in its installations. That's booming in the US. I mean, how, how difficult it is to set up a space to take care of your kids in your company? It's not that difficult. Right, so if companies do this, they also increase uh, the, their attractiveness in a way. Uh, they lure in more human talent and, and women. So for, in, in the co-working sector of Medellin, nobody has done this. No, neither Incan Hub nor Camel Hub. So about 50% of our incubator programs, we do have a quota. 50% of our projects do have to be led by, by women. And one might think that that's a very difficult quota to, uh, to comply with, but, it, but it's not. Sometimes you don't even need the, sometimes it's just a, a question of marketing. How do you create, uh, how do you sell your idea to um, address more women, right? So if in your marketing team, for example, we in Impact Hub, our rule is that 70% of the people that work in Impact Hub have to be women. That gives us a completely different vision, which is challenging us all the time. They have to include a gender perspective, but also have a gender impact. So if we set up uh, an example as a company, others might catch up. I have another example. Uh, in Vector, uh, an electric mobility company, I have the opposite effect. We haven't been able to find a woman who will join in. I don't know why. It's not because there are no female mechanics. I believe that you have to have the will to go and try to make your company uh, more inclusive and to have both genders. Sometimes the company has to show the will to incorporate diversity in your company and that will definitely help you scale. So there's a challenge for everyone. Salo, uh, I, was, I was discussing yesterday with one of my associates in Vector, the electric mobility company. Salo, we are only four males. We need women here. 
So one of our sh short term goals uh, right now, we're working with uh, companies that are cultivating the wood that we use. But once we d define uh, the type of uh, specify those materials and define which are we going to use with our prototypes, if that wood, the acacia that's being used, cultivated uh, in the, the low valley of the Calca River, how can we guarantee as a company that we'll outreach those producers? So that we can guarantee that our company is benefiting those companies that supply raw materials to include the pro producer economy, uh, c community. In a way, you're also helping them to increase their competitivity standards, to perhaps to technify themselves. So in a way, as a company, you're creating a development impact. You are a user of a, of a feedstock wood, but you're also looking back in your value chain because you benefit from them becoming stronger. So it was a very nice conversation. Thank you. I would like to talk about uh, the value chain, including um, the communities and work with providers, suppliers. Next week, we have to draft a few work programs with SMEs because they they provide about 70% of the products that the government offices use. So, so how can we incentivize the use of companies that have a you know, circular economy in their plans? Also, about that, if you do buy from us, try to pay us soon. So I would like to close now. I would like to for everyone to make a closing comment, perhaps an inspirational one about w what's happening right now, what are the things that are success stories. We obviously know that we need to reconfigure and redefine lots of things, but let's close this session with a, with an inspirational story from each one of you, right? Get them to elicit from them the desire to learn more. How can I help from my post and from the public sector? What's my responsibility as a client in trans helping transform the country and the territory? So I'd like to invite you perhaps uh, in, in like a Twitter comment, very shortly in an inspirational way, what should we do and where are we going with this? Okay, very well. In Impact Hub, we were born in April, and we've done more than 200 events in this ecosystem, and we always look at different entrepreneurs that reach us. We have our open, we, our doors open. I would like to cooperate with the ministry to explicitly tell them these are the challenges of the entrepreneur sector. I believe that we can share with us, so do count on us. And whoever, you know, who wants to come into the ecosystem, Impact Hub and Camel Hub, our doors are open. We do work cooperatively here. That's our DNA. So from the company side, we need to start taking actions, not waiting so much for some changes um, to be done at the regulation level and from the government side. There are changes that can be implemented from the industry side. Start thinking better designs. And as consumers, also changing our consumption habits. Paying attention to what we are supporting with our purchase decision and try to source locally as a customer. Buy locally. Also giving a chance to other allies and to also work cooperatively. In the end, circular economy is impacts everything. As you mentioned, Either we do this now, or we're doomed. Yeah, right. We have to foster the changes ourselves, not wait for things to change to get on the wagon. I believe it is a mindset shift. Whoever consumes products is like bringing a child to the world. If I consume something, I'm responsible for the product till the end of its life cycle. So I cannot abandon it. I have to take, take responsibility so people need to shift their mindset and 
feel proud of their purchase decisions. I would like to close with a few questions, basic keywords. I believe that there are open doors from the government side. There are good intentions, will. We're trying to articulate different stakeholders, but there's also a very clear vision of where we want to go with this transition to circular economy. Thank you very much for everyone. It was a very interesting session. I believe I learned a lot. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin, Sefa, and the efforts that the platform is doing and the foundation is doing. So the doors are open to continue this conversation off camera. Thank you very much.